Hi, I'm Wayne Tuttle, and welcome to Chasing Legends. Welcome back to Chasing Legends. I'm Wayne Tuttle, your host again. Hope you everybody had a Merry Christmas. Here we are winding down the last Chasing Legends of the year. Before we get any further, please hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, go to our about section, check out legendofthesuperstitionmountains.com for all the other information. Bark notes, um, archival type videos, all kinds of stuff. Continuing down our rabbit hole for this year and going into next year. This next story is one that Mr. Frank Augustine referenced. Now, he did a very, very brief, you could almost call it even, I don't know, he was shorter than brief. And we're going to take you there just so you revisit what Frank had to say. When it comes to the Superstition Mountains, you hear a lot of stories and legends, UFOs, uh, Mayans, Lizard men. Right before we started filming the legend show, <clears throat> I was in a family room and my wife Angie walks in and she looked at me and said, I'm, a, I'm worried about you and Woody going back in the mountains. I'm like, why? We could take care of ourselves. <clears throat> so she hands me her cell phone and she says, read this. But there's a story on there about an occurrence that supposedly took place in the superstitions. There was this woman. She decided that she's going to take a hike up one of the mountains. So she hikes all the way up, almost to the top of this one mountain. And she looks across the valley. And she sees something shine. You know, like if you had a mirror something reflecting off of it. So she climbs all the way down that mountain and hikes up the other one. And when she gets up by the, the shiny thing, she trips and she falls into like a cave. So when she fell, she's like laying on her back and she opens her eyes up, and standing in front of her was this huge lizard man. And the lizard man had a, I won't say it, but you can imagine what it was. So the lizard man in the story rapes her, and the next thing she knows, she's on the Apache Trail driving toward Apache Junction. So I started laughing. <laughs> and Angie looked at me seriously. She says, laugh now, cry later. Okay, now, welcome back. We're going to go into the story, and the story is known. It's actually been out there and been published and so forth. It's known as Angie. Has to do with someone named Angie. She has a sister named Susan. But other than that, we don't got much information about her. Um, Sherry Hinkle um, was told the story by her sister Phyllis Davis. And Phyllis Davis supposedly met Angie and talked to her and then put the, all the material together. And then Sherry Hinkle got the whole written story then from the woman named Angie, if that's even her name. Um, she lived in Patchy Junction. She had a little time off, and she'd been, she liked to go out and hike in the foothills of the Superstition Mountains. So she goes out, and she's hiking one day, and she's just kind of covering around. She looks up and sees a shiny rock. So she decides to hike up to that shiny rock. It's an outcropping of quartz, and it's really nice looking, but it's way too big to haul back down the mountain. So she works and works at it, trying to break off a small piece of it. She breaks off a little piece of it, kind of thinking, well, that's kind of neat and all this stuff. Because she, she likes to collect little rocks, take them home from her trips. As she finishes this, she looks over <clears throat> and sees a little cave. And she's like, kind of get excited because she's like, wow, I wonder if that's something like archaeological. It'd be something in there, something indigenous or, you know, what, what was that about? 
So she climbs up, works her way up to this cave, gets up to it, starts to look inside. And as she starts to go in, she realizes it's pretty clean. Doesn't look like even any animals been in there, but there's nothing else in there. Nothing archaeological. A little disappointed, but it's cooler. Day's warmed up. She's enjoying the cool air in there. She sits there, drinks from her canteen, chills out for a while. And then she decides, well, I only got a little flashlight. She has a little flashlight on her keychain that she looks around in the cave with. But she said, it's not enough light really to walk all the way back down in the dark. So I'm going to have to get out of here, start back to my car. She goes to leave. Next thing she knows is she feels something grabs her by the leg. She looks back, thinks it's some people she knows or someone with masks on. And she jokes with them, kind of like, what are you guys doing up here? What kind of prank is this? And then she just suddenly said, she started getting kind of feeling alarmed, like, what's going on? Because they're being kind of rough. And then she blacks out. <sighs> she doesn't really remember any of this to initially at first. She just knows she went hiking. And we'll jump ahead and then come back to this. Because what happens is she wakes up in her car. And it's night. And she's driving, and she's kind of thrown off that she suddenly realizes she's driving. Like, where's my head been? Where's my mind been? Why? What am I doing? You know, I'm on the road heading home. She gets home. She ends up taking a shower for like two hours. She can't get herself clean. And she's washing and washing and washing. She gets done, makes herself dinner, turns on the TV. She says she couldn't watch the TV. She seems totally just something like something's in the back of her mind bothering her. And then on top of it, additionally, she just picks at her food. She realizes she's not hungry. She's not feeling right. Next day, her sister Susan comes over and checks on her because she wasn't answering her phone, finds her in bed. After a few days of this, she's not really eating. She's just staying in bed. She's not. She's just kind of listless. Her sister convinces her to go to the doctor. She goes to the doctor. The doctor says it's probably the flu or something. Rest a little, get back to work. Spends a couple more days off. Pulls herself together goes back to work. She works at a pet shop. She goes in the pet shop. Everything's fine first day or so. She's not quite herself still, but she's doing better. And then someone comes in with a lizard of sort. She said she never had any problem with lizards on hikes and stuff. She'd see them and stuff like But the person brought it in. She said there was something revolting and terrorized her. She literally almost went into an anxiety or panic attack. And it bothered her and bothered her, and she had to literally go home for the day because of this, because she just was so unnerved, but she had no clue why. So she goes home, she talks to her sister, and then a friend, they, they talk to some friends, and a friend says, I know a hypnotherapist, why don't you go to them and see what's there, because you can't remember anything, because she's saying, I don't know of anything that's bothering me, but there's obviously something affecting me. So they take her to a hypnotherapist, he puts her under. He finds out that she'd been raped. He thinks, oh, okay, this is what happened. She'd been out, someone accosted her. She was raped, and she has this suppressed stuff. And then the hypnotherapist finds out she has this overlaid imagination where she has this some sort of lizard people that have raped her. But then the hypnotherapist starts realizing there's way too much detail to this story. And he starts working with her on it. He really wants her to recommend her to someone else, but she doesn't want to talk to anybody else at this point. Other than her sister, um, Sherry Hinkle's sister, um, Phyllis, and maybe another friend, she doesn't really want anyone else to know. So she tells the therapist, I'll just keep working with you. What comes out of the story is, so when she blacks out, it appears that it's when she's in that cave. Something grabbed her. She thought she saw someone wearing masks. She blacks out. When she wakes up, she's still in a cave, but it's not quite the same cave. She said she was in some sort of gelatin or gel or something. It was holding her down on something. She wasn't quite sure what she was on. She was trying to look around. There really wasn't anything. It was a, and there were these lizard people. Now, she thought at that time that it was still something of a joke. She thought they had to be wearing masks and like some sort of like outfits and someone playing a practical joke. And then she realized, maybe this is really serious. They're going to rape me, but they're doing this to hide their identities. And so she tried to plead with them. I was like, you know, I don't know what you're doing. I've never seen your faces. Just let me go. She was hoping to get through to them. Now, she said two of them had kind of greenish um, skin. They had a ridge up on their top of their head. Um, the green kind of turned into gray going down the backside. 
Um, there was a lot of them wore little black, kind of black outfits. And they had a dragon within a circle that had a star in it. And then they had these other patterns on them. And, and some of them were black. The two that were with her pri primarily had on these, um, I, I remember it was white outfits. But the same decals or whatever. And she said they had very cruel eyes. So she's laying there and she starts to panic because she suddenly realizes, oh my God, I've been accosted by these people. They're wearing masks. They're going to rape me. Oh my God. And she starts panicking, screaming, and just carrying on fighting everything she can. And she said they had a blue light or something They in a box or something. They t moved towards her. And she said, I black out again. So she comes to a second time. And this time she comes to and she said she was in like an oval-shaped room. And she lay in there, and there's still a few of those black, the, the lizard people in the black, and there's the ones that were um, in the white outfits, but now there's one in an orange jumpsuit. And he has other insignia, like these inverted triangles and different stuff. She said he had a badge on his chest that had, like, it moved, like the stars in it moved and stuff. It was very kind of odd-looking. And she's starting to realize the seriousness of what's going on, like she's losing her mind or something. The same gelatin type whatever it is is holding her down on something and she's looking around this room and she realizes the thing that's looking at her all the others have yellow eyes this one had blue so she thought they seemed empathetic so she was trying to tell it please please help me please help me you're scaring me and she said and then it reached out and touched her with something and her whole body relaxed which was weird to her because she said my mind's still scrambling I'm still feeling mentally like I'm panicked but my body is totally relaxed and it won't fight. And she said, I'm just laying there and thinking, oh my God. So she's looking around the room, trying to figure out where am I, try to get any details for the police, what's happening. And she looks over and sees these bags, um, some sort of bags hanging from the wall. And there's movement in them. And she says it reminded her of the movement in her dog's belly when it had puppies. And that put her into a panic attack. She turns her eyes, looks... And one of the um, reptilian creatures that's in white undoes his pants and he is about to proceed to have sex with her. She says, then everything, whatever they had done to her, just she let loose. She's fighting, trying to get out of the gelatin, whatever it is. And she's starting to move herself forward, getting out of this stuff. And as she's starting to break free and stuff and starts screaming and yelling, Something else happens and boom, she goes completely to black again as she feels the thing start to lean, the pressure come on her. So the therapist works with her for quite some time. Um, she won't go in the mountains ever again. But she's like, she figures if these things ever want to get her, she has no defense. She's able to carry on with her life through the therapy and everything. And that's the story that Sherry Hinkle would tell on a number of radio shows and publish in a number of places. Um, it's very interesting. The therapist himself said, um, told Angie, the girl in the story, is that he wouldn't have believed it and believed she was probably her imagination carried away, but he said there was so much detail of every piece of insignia, everything in the oval room. She had so much detail, but none of it was relevant to anything he'd ever heard of. So he said she had way too much detail, seemed to be really too much in the place, and he said she was genuinely seemed terrified. Um, however, he worked with her on this therapy, and she led a normal life. She will deny this if she's ever contacted by someone. Um, I don't know if they name Angie or Susan as actually a real person, or if they were, those names were used just basically to cover up on this whole story. Now, the story, I find some interest in it. Because now while this story happens in March of 2000, it, what's really odd is that there is a secondary story that goes with this. And the author of it, again, is Sherry Hinkle. Now these are the two primary, I know you'll say, oh, there's other lizard stories and this and that. But it's kind of a bit of an odd thing because it's the same author again. And she did some interviews. Now this one takes place sometime in later in the 2000s around 2010 that she starts telling it she never gives a date or anything she says her son mark and his friend harry are out exploring out behind their house by black mountain which she calls black mountain and while out there they find this cave or something similar to what's on the other story 
But this story has a little bit of a difference. They get in the cave and they're messing around and they find a door. And it's like an iron door, but it's sealed shut or something. It looks very old. And they mess around with a little, nothing's happening. They try to take the door open and uh, nothing. But as they're getting ready to leave, they're looking around and there's nothing really in there, but then they find this metal rod. It's a short metal rod and it has like a cap on the end. And there's some little kind of like some sort of glyphs on it. Not necessarily hieroglyphics or anything like that, but there's some sort of glyphs along it. So she said the boys kind of got kind of creeped out a little being in there, decided to get out. As soon as they got out and they're getting out, they looked back and they saw something greenish grayish climbing out the hole that they'd went into and came out after them. So they ran down, ran home, got home just out of breath, came home and started telling her all about the story. He said, look, we went up here, found this little cave opening, went down. There was another kind of opening there. We went in there. There was this door, all the stuff. She's kind of thinking they're making a lot of this up. But then they produced this little metal rod. And they show her the metal rod. She takes it and she's looking at it. She said there's nothing to twist on it, push on it, nothing. It's just like a solid metal rod with this little cap on it. The cap didn't do anything come off. She looks at it, puts it aside, puts it away, doesn't think anything more of it, tells the boys, get to bed. She realizes they got an overactive imagination. Who knows what they found? That night, Mark's in bed, and he starts screaming and yelling. She comes running down the hall. He says, there's, he comes, meets her at the door. Something trying to get in my window. She goes over, pulls open the drapes, and there's this reptilian-looking thing with greenish gray head. And it's got a hand on the window and it's trying to work on the window. And she has a flashlight and she's holding it at it. And she's trying to reach around in the room and find something to kind of hit it with. He said, suddenly it just stops. Stares at her. Does a weird hissing noise and then just, pew, it's gone. So what Sherry said, she figured it wanted to retrieve that bar. So what she did was the next day she went out to that cave she just loudly talked about it outside, threw it back down into the hole, and they were never bothered again. Now, of course, everybody would see my little problem with this is we have two very different stories. One initially came to Sherry Hinkle. Suddenly, she's incorporated her son, her son's friend, in a different place. Very, very similar story happens. Um, I've never met anyone that met this person named Angie or her sister Phyllis or any of the other people involved in this. Um, so I don't know if these people are actual people. I've heard the alleged serpent people type thing. I've never met anyone that says they've encountered anything like that in the mountains or seen anything in these caves or stuff. I've been in plenty of caves down mine shafts, never seen anything like that. So it makes you kind of like take it like, let's take a grain of salt to these types of stories. Because they seem to be bred of of individuals that suddenly become writers. They start putting out books, and Sherry Hinkle wrote several books and several pieces that was very focused on this underground bases with reptile people, and that becomes a big thing with her. She continues on, and other people have picked it up, and they talk. Now, we don't have any pictures of them or anything like that. We have several stories, but the stories seem to have similarities that always make me feel, rather than where you might say, well, the stories are similar, so it must be real. I always say, the stories seem kind of similar, like they're just taking that one story and just keep developing it into other stories in other places. Superstition Mountains, well, close to 50 years, I've never run into a reptile person or anything out there. So that's the fully developed version, and you can look that up because Sherry Hinkle's story is actually quite out there in a number of different shapes and forms. It's always the Angie story. It's always March of 2000. It generally out of Apache Junction, a lot of it stays the same. There's a little bit of changes and different things that are added in detail and not. Um, I've never seen a blow-by-blow -blow accounting or the actual transcript of whatever Angie would have sent Sherry, which is what we'd want to see. Is like, okay, what did this woman actually say to you? So there we go. I think Sherry Hinkle is still out there. I think she's up in Vegas or New Mexico somewhere. She's still out there fighting the good fight, writing books and articles about this UFO stuff. And I don't understand. I guess these things come from other planets and go down in caves and stuff and whatever and are impregnating people and doing all that kind of stuff. Who knows? Never met one. Don't really care to meet one, but hey, if they come by, eh. 
they must go on their own way, right? So there's the fully developed idea of what Frank was trying to tell that time. And I don't blame him for wanting to go into detail because it gets a bit more ridiculous the more you tell it. But there you go, down another rabbit hole for everybody this week. Hope everybody had a great Christmas. So when you want to know where the reptile stories come from in the Superstition Mountains, this seems to be in 2000, the first one I ever heard of. And I'd heard of that stuff, but I don't remember as a kid in the 70s or 80s ever hearing about any of this stuff. So it seems to be much more of a modern-day development urban legend with the mountains. Um, I asked Nat around a number of people, and they couldn't come up with something real early about that. So that appears to be that. So we've tried, and we've went around, and we, you know, the Steve Brody story, and we've touched the Black Legion, and now we got the Angie story. And we still got a little more. There's a few more. But I think as you unpack these, you'll see where people ask, can you tell us the stories about this or that in the mountains? You'll see how these things kind of develop and kind of, they maybe come from somewhere else and they kind of attach themselves. We never have a definitive date. We never have an actual real reporter. It's always a UFO writer or someone like this. So I, I always have to say, we got to take that stuff with a grain of salt. So there you go. Hope you really did enjoy it. Hope you had a wonderful Christmas. Hope you get down over to www.legendofsuperstitionmountains.com because it's really cool stuff. We keep putting up those bark notes and stuff. Hope you're enjoying the Friday archives. Last week's Clay Worst was really cool getting a look at the old wasp and Clay being on there and doing that. Got more to come. Always got more stuff to do. So thank you for joining us. I hope everybody has a great end of the year and a happy new year. Until the next time, remember, I'm Wayne Tuttle. You're not. And this was Chasing Legends.